Hi, my name is Allison Palmer. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about religious art, and I've uh, decided to talk about the painter Jan van Eyck. Um, I teach uh, art history in the School of Visual Arts, and I teach primarily Renaissance and Baroque art in Europe, which spans the time period from the late Middle Ages, beginning around the 1300s with a painter named Giotto, if you're familiar with him in Italy, uh, and then uh, Jan van Eyck in the 1400s, uh, all the way through the 1600s. Um, I teach some upper division art history classes. So if you're interested in this area of study, you can always contact me uh, and ask me about my courses for the future. So um, let me put on uh, the, the uh, screen where we can just start looking at these images. Um, and I wanted to show you, actually I'm small screen, so you may not be able to see them, but um, there are lots of really interesting good books that are in the Fine Arts Library on Jan van Eyck. This is one of the more recent ones uh, on him. He's very well-known artist. And one of the reasons why he's so well-known is because he was the first to really revolutionize the use of oil paint at this time period when most artists were painting with tempera paints. And I'm gonna talk a moment about the the differences um, that resulted uh, from the use of oil paints. Um, here's another really great book. Uh, this is on artists in Northern Europe in the 1400s. Um, and then finally, um, Jan van Eyck. You can see how his last name is spelled V-A-N-E-Y-C-K, all the way to Albert Dürer. Um, these are the, probably the two best known artists of the Renaissance in Northern Europe, okay? So Jan van Eyck worked in the North. Um, when we think of the Renaissance, we tend to think of Italy and we tend to think of the classical revival in Italy. But in Northern Europe, there's fascinating uh, studies uh, in painting, sculpture, and architecture. And it's really in painting that we see uh, these artists um, have uh, sort of developed this technique that even goes beyond what artists were doing in Italy. So what I'm showing you here is what is called the Ghent altarpiece. Um, and that's what I want to just focus on this one painting uh, as I talk to you today. Um, Van Eyck painted large altarpieces like this one. He did portraits. He did smaller panel paintings. But this is, uh, I think, his most famous work. Um, we see it here in the museum. And I'll show you details in a bit. Um, so there are people in front. So you can see the scale of the painting. It's one that is called called a polyptic, P-O-L-Y, poly, polyptic, meaning that it has multiple panels. And as you can see from the curvature, those panels fold in. So you can fold the top separately or the bottom separately, or you can fold both in. And the bottom you can see folds twice. It has one panel that goes in and then the separate, uh, the second one. And then if you close all the panels and they go right down that middle, uh, and so they're symmetrical, right? Okay. And so they're separate panels made of wood uh, that are hinged together and then painted with this new oil technique. Um, you see in the upper right corners figures of Adam on your left and Eve on the right, and those are black and white. And the reason for that is those two panels are lost. This altarpiece was disassembled and it was hidden away during the war. And this is one of the paintings that Hitler um, uh, wanted in the collection that he was creating. He was, he was starting to create his own collection um, by looting all from all of these museums across Europe. And then uh, he was gonna create uh, this huge museum of European art. So this is one of the uh, panels that was uh, taken apart and then hidden away and then um, uh, some pieces of it were found in the mines where uh, some of the, his paintings, Hitler's uh, stolen paintings were found. Um, if you haven't seen the movie Monuments Men, um, it's, a, it's a really good movie. Um, it's a historical kind of reenactment, but it features uh, some aspects of uh, Jan van Eyck's paintings in it. It's a, it's a, good, it's a good movie to see, uh, so you can see what was going on during World War II. Anyway, so that's what happened to those two paintings. 
channels, they're lost. And so restorers um, just put them in in black and white. So we know what was originally there and, and we have old black and white photographs of them. So we know exactly what they look like and everything, but um, we leave them without color so that you can see that they're not the original, okay? Um, you'll see some images where they are in color because there are copies that are done in color too. So you can put put in the copies or put in the original or put in the black and white like this, however, um, however you want to do it. Um, anyway, so this is how it's displayed in the museum, which is in the cathedral in the town of Ghent. Ghent is spelled G-H-E-N-T. It's in Northern Europe and it was a prosperous town uh, at this time period. Um, and so uh, patrons uh, would pay uh, and donate money to churches to have altarpieces and paintings painted in the side chapels of the church. Um, so that's what happened here. We have a donor, donor and his wife um, who, who paid for this altarpiece. Now this was located at the, at the high altar of the church. Now it's off to the side. It was a put in a chapel off to the side and now in, you know, it's become a museum, but it was at the high altar. And so that is in part why it's so large, because when you walk into these cathedrals, if, if any of you have been into these large Gothic cathedrals in Europe, you'll know how big they are. And so you need a large altarpiece or crucifixion or something over the high altar so that when you walk in, these churches are axially aligned. You can see straight ahead uh, to this painting. All right. So religious paintings um, at this time period and still today have typically two functions. Um, uh, they're what is called a liturgical object, which means that they're used for the liturgy. OK, so they have an actual function within the church. And um, those two functions uh, are one is that they act as an icon. Um, you've heard the word icon. Um, icon means something uh, in this context. It means something that you pray to, to help increase your devotion, sort of like a portal to higher enlightenment. So something that is iconic um, is a kind of an image that you might see repeatedly over and over and over again that helps remind you uh, of your devotions, okay? Um, you know the word icon is often used in a different context, but its, a, its original uh, um, kind of meaning is within this religious context. Um, and so that's through prayer, uh, through worship. And then the second function of religious art is that it's educational. So it's didactic, okay? So these panels can be used to remind uh, the viewer of particular stories or images. Uh, Adam and Eve on the upper right corners lead in toward music making angels you see in the panels next and then the next two panels include the Virgin Mary on our viewers left, which is uh, an image where she appears in this beautiful royal blue made of lapis. Um, and then on the other side is uh, John the Baptist wearing this incredible uh, kind of green, emerald green robe. And then of course the figure in the center is God. God is very rarely represented in art. Michelangelo represented him. Uh, and um, when he is represented, he's usually shown like this, like a king. So he is in the center. He is elevated above everyone else. So when we talk about the idea of visual hierarchy. Um, an artist will uh, use visual hierarchy to help draw your eye to particular figures within a painting. So indeed, having, having God in the center, elevated above everyone else, that's part of the hierarchy of the church, but it's also visual hierarchy, so our eyes go right there. He's blessing. He has his hands up in this blessing gesture. He wears a red robe, which is a sign of royalty. He's on a throne. He has a tiara on his head, which is particularly the papal tiara. Um, and then at his feet is a crown. So he's the king, um, uh, certainly. Okay. And then uh, I'll show you details of all these uh, in a moment. But then down below, uh, you see the center panel has uh, an adoration scene in the middle, and then you can see groups of people uh, flanked around uh, this vast landscape that goes off into the distance where we see uh, these sort of pinnacles of churches and buildings rising up uh, in, the, in the distant landscape.
Okay, so this is when you open the panel, this is what we see. So Jan van Eyck painted this um, when uh, he was fairly young. He painted it with his brother, um, Hubert or Hubert van Eyck. Um, and his brother uh, was primarily known for the um, frame of the painting. Now, what you see here is the panels closed, but you don't see the original frame. You see a very simple spare frame here. The original frame was damaged um, when the panels were taken out of it, um, but it would have been a very elaborate, beautiful, gothic styled uh, um, heavily kind of carved uh, frame, all right? So what we see now is just a very simple frame that's not meant to really take away from uh, the panels that we're looking at. Uh, and so when you look at frames, a lot of times we don't kind of think about the frames, but sometimes you'll see examples of original frames. Uh, and those are definitely worth noting because the history of framing is, 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 is kind of an, a, a real interesting uh, research project, I think. Anyway, um, that's an aside, but, uh, but here we see the panels closed. Um, and so in the upper area, we see on our left, if we look from the viewer's left, the angel Gabriel has come down and is kneeling and Gabriel has his hands up. He has his wings out behind him. He's wearing this beautiful white robe and he's clutching lilies in his hand, all right? He's looking across those middle two panels to the other side where we see the Virgin Mary also dressed in white. Remember on the inside, she's got blue on. Here she has white, which is a symbol of her purity, all right? The inside panel where she's wearing blue, that's a symbol of her role as the queen of the heavens, the color of the sky seated next to God, all right? So she wears different colors depending on what kind of symbolic intent we mean uh, or the artist means uh, for the viewer to understand, all right? Um, so color symbolism is also an important aspect of of uh, uh, religious, um, uh, the function of uh, religious art in the Renaissance. And that's where we get the, this value of oil paint, all right? Um, so the Virgin Mary has this white dove over her head, which is uh, the Holy Spirit. Um, and so there are also words, if you can see them, there are words that go across from Gabriel's mouth into the ear of the Virgin Mary that tells her, Hail Mary, full of grace, uh, the Lord is with you. And so this is Gabriel coming down to alert the Virgin Mary that she is going to give birth to Christ, okay? Um, and so this is this sort of prophetic prophetic moment called the Annunciation. Above are prophets uh, with scrolls come, kind of coming over their heads. These are Old Testament or even ancient prophets, two females in the center, two males on the side panels that foretell the coming of Christ. All right. Down below, the outside panels include the donor kneeling with his hands together in prayer. That was that's the dip, typical sort of donor portrait of this time period. He's wearing this lavish red with fur on the inside. And then his wife on the opposite panel, she too is kneeling wearing red, but she has this sort of humble um, uh, veil over her hair. So it's a sign of humility when they kneel with their hands clasped together like this. Middle two panels show figures that look like sculpture. Um, on uh, one side, on the on the left is John the Evangelist. Or sorry, on the left is John the Baptist, and on the right is John the Evangelist. The two Johns, young and old, and they're shown like sculpture in a gray tone, which is called grisaille. Grisaille is a gray tone often used. Um, in religious painting to allude to the kind of sculptural programs that you might find outside of Gothic churches to bring that outside sculpture, unify it with the paintings on the inside. And indeed, the four figures on the bottom all look like they're standing inside of niches, uh, which is, again, what you would find on the outside. And then there's also typically niche figures carved on the inside of a church as well. Whereas in the Annunciation, if you look at that, you'll see that the Virgin Mary looks like she is in a, a 
kind of a patrician home. You can see the windows. We can look out those windows, in fact, and see a kind of a town square below. So this is sort of an upper story uh, window. Um, and if you look out, you can see just the incredible detail of what looks like a Dutch town square. So why would the why would the artist do this? Um, this is a sacred scene, but by placing this in a kind of a context that people would actually recognize at this time period, uh, by bringing this sort of heavenly miraculous story down to uh, people's uh, uh, what they see in their everyday life, um, it gives this idea that that these miracles actually did occur on Earth, and that. That, that people are witnesses, humans are witnesses, um, and that miracles can continue to, to occur for people who believe, all right? So this sort of proximity between heaven and earth is part of the humanism, the spirit of humanism that we find in the Renaissance as well. So it's not like it's making the religious work secular, but it's making um, the physical world around us a part of the spiritual world in the way that Thomas Aquinas meant it, which is that the um, spiritual world is a spiritual manifestation of the physical world, okay, the corporal world. And so there, it's almost like they're two sides of the same coin, all right? Um, so if we move along here to the next image, this is just a close-up view, so you can see a little better. Um, there's a niche in the Virgin's room. There's a towel hanging uh, next to water basin that is holy water, and then the towel looks like a prayer shawl. Here you can see the words a little bit better that come across from the angel Gabriel. And the words, um, you can see them across several. One, one panel, you can't see them as well, but the other three panels, uh, if you look carefully, you can see the words. And so these are separate wooden panels, but they're meant to have that unified interior appearance. All right. It's unified. Yet, if you look at the floor, um, you can see where the angel Gabriel is. That's a lighter kind of a, a, a floor, tile floor. And so um, Jan van Eyck has made the floor tile specifically so that the lines kind of come up and um, they're like orthogonal lines that curve in a little bit. So it looks like there's actual physical space here. Yet in the middle panels, it tilts a little bit. And then it, on the side where the Virgin is, it kind of matches up where Gabriel is, all right? So you have the sense of a realistic space, but then there's a little bit of tilting uh, uh, in the middle, all right? Um, and she is, of course, reading a devotional prayer book herself, kneeling with her hands clasped together like this in front of a window where the light would be coming in. You can even see the pages starting to turn just a bit. And look at the angel's wings, Gabriel's wings, um, the beautiful wings. This idea of beauty uh, is something that you find in a lot of religious works at this time period. In the, in the Renaissance, beauty was a, a, a way to inspire people through the beauty of the religious images and to honor the religious figures themselves, all right, uh, to kind of match the beauty of the heavenly realm. So, um, so creating beautiful works was, in fact, an artistic goal at this time period. So if we open the panel back up now, here it is flat, and here it is with Adam and Eve kind of done um, in a little bit of color uh, on either end. Um, and so if we look at the lower end now without people's heads standing in front, um, you can see in the lower level that there is the adoration of the lamb right in the center. Um, and then below there's a fountain, an octagonal fountain with a kind of a pinnacle above it. And that pinnacle provides a line that brings our eye up past the altar right above to where God is. So you can bifurcate this image, this idea of symmetry it suggests balance and harmony, which are these ideals of beauty at this time period. All right. So then um, if you look, you can see all kinds of people. On the left, you see people coming in on horseback. Some of those are soldiers who fight to spread Christianity across far-flung parts of the world. So there are uh, knights in many cases and members of the aristocracy who ride horseback. Um, coming into the front on that side, kneeling are uh, members of these mendicant orders 
orders, religious orders. And then on the right side, you have the high level clergy together with other monks kneeling. So the clerics wear these red robes and uh, past a history of popes all wear papal tiaras the way God does. Um, and then further back, you have these uh, different religious orders, some that take vows of poverty. Um, and so they're wearing much more humble spare clothing. And then the, in the back around the altar, you see these angels with wings kneeling around. Um, this is the adoration of the lamb. Uh, one, there's a, a cross there. Um, and then uh, the figures in the back, you have these uh, um, female figures who are martyred saints, virgins, uh, all of these people in one way or another have devoted themselves to uh, their religion, okay? And this is Catholicism. This is 1430s, which is before the Protestant Reformation. So this is all one church, the Catholic church. So you have saints and everything in, in Catholicism, okay? Um, and so th what this shows then on the lower level is that they are all different types of people. Some have active lives. Some people go out and fight for the cause. Some people have contemplative lives. They stay in monasteries and pray. Some people are wealthy, some people are poor, but everyone gathers together here in unison. So there's idea of harmony and concord as people gather together around this lamb. All right. Um, and then I think you can see a little better. Adam and Eve, um, uh, of course, are the ones that sort of lead all of this. So it's like linking the Old Testament with the New Testament, this idea that Eve sort of anticipates the virgin and the virgin rectifies the mistakes that Eve makes. All right. So here the virgin is wearing blue, as I mentioned, as the queen of the heavens. All right. Red and blue and purple are all royal colors, which is why Today, um, cardinals wear red, and this is why God is represented wearing red here, because he's the king, okay? Now, if you look in the background, you see this incredible spatial development on the earthly realm, and you don't see that on the heavenly realm, all right? That's the earthly realm, uh, but the heavenly realm still does have some spatial development. In the foreground, where the figures are seated, you can see tile going back, but tilting up in these orthogonal lines to suggest three-dimensional space. All right, so there's always this sort of a connection between the physical body, the corporal world, and the spiritual world. Okay, so this is that kind of transition. Um, and if you look at the uh, angels, look at their incredible robes. They too are wearing um, these beautiful robes that are done in gold brocade. Now, the article I want you to read uh, to get to um, uh, coordinate with this talk is one that talks in more detail about the clothing, um, because that's something with oil paint that Jan van Eyck really, really gets in detail here. Uh, these The cloth of honor that's so important in these religious works. It gives the painting a very, very tactile quality, as if the view themselves are participating in this through this incredible kind of heightened realism where we can see um, all of the details of the clothing and the figures themselves. So in terms of the viewer participating in this painting, because that's what makes it real for the viewer, if you look at the lower level, right smack in the middle, you see um, on the lower part of the frame, you see Van Eyck and then the date 1432. Uh, that's a later uh, identification for the museum. But right above the middle of that, you see what looks like a ditch um, in the dirt. And in fact, that is the holy water. So the, um, so the um, lamb is being sacrificed. So this is a sacrificial lamb and there's her blood pouring out of his heart into this chalice. Uh, and then the holy water that you can see in this basin that is used for baptisms, there is a spigot and then a niche uh, so that it looks like the water is pouring to the very edge of the painting. So it's like the water pours out to us, okay, to baptize us uh, in this instance. So there's a very immediate kind of uh, quality about these paintings. Um, and that's something um, 
that Jan van Eyck really achieved with uh, his use of oil paint, all right? Here's a detail. And so when you read the article, I'm sorry that the article has black and white pictures in it, it's unfortunate, but if you look online, you, you will find tons of these details of Jan van Eyck's paintings because they're so splendid. Um, so back to the use of oil paint, let me talk a little bit about that because you, you can achieve this kind of painting with oil paint in a way that you can't with tempera. So so by changing the sort of medium or the materials the artist is using, um, it really heightens in many ways, many people think this sort of religious tone of this uh, painting. This is the detail of, of God's robe. Um, and so tempera paint is a ground up pigment. If you have mortar and pestle, you will ground up um, colors from the soil or elements. You may ground up uh, precious stones um, or reds that come from plants, red dyes. Purple comes from shellfish, so that's a little more rare. Blue that the Virgin wears comes from lapis lazuli. And so that was imported at this time period through what is modern day Afghanistan across the Silk Route into Venice and into the rest of Europe through the port in Venice. So a lot of these colors were very, very precious. Um, and then here you see gold. This is actually gold. Um, in older paintings, gold would be hammered on, but in this case, it's mixed with um, the oil. Uh, and so you can actually apply gold. You can see the little tiny, tiny brush strokes right here on this gold. Um, and so with oil paint then, or actually with tempera paint, back to that, so you mix the um, grind up the color and then it's mixed with a binding agent, which is, egg. So it's either egg yolk or egg white or a mixture of the two, depending if you need that yellow or if you just need the white. Uh, sometimes you need that yellow or even sort of an orange. Sometimes eggs have orange middle, right, um, to, to make the color. So, you, so egg gets sticky, right? And so think of the properties of an egg. Um, egg will get sticky when it dries. Um, uh, and sometimes it's kind of gloppy a little bit, but um, these artists would mix in a little bit of water so that um, it would just be very smooth, shiny. You know how egg, dried egg can be shiny, so you get this kind of glossy surface. You can, um, and so, but it's a very thin kind of wash. Once you add in a little bit of the water, you get, and then you, it, it has to be very smooth, right? So you smooth it out, um, a thin wash of color. Um, but the thing with egg is that you can't layer that color. You can't paint some, layer lay some down and then come back and paint some more later and then paint some more later because it will flake off. So you get essentially one layer of paint with tempera. Okay. Um, and so uh, tempera tends to dry quickly. And so you can paint large areas. Um, tempera is sometimes used for fresco painting, which is painting on a damp plaster, but often fresco painting just consists of ground pigment with water. So that's even thinner and it'll soak into the to the plaster a little bit, but um, these are all wood panels and tempera painting was typically done on wood. So it lays on the surface of the wood. Um, and so prior to painting the wood, I forgot to mention this, but prior to painting the wood, you, you need to sort of prime it, sand it's very, very smooth and you might apply wax or some other uh, kind of material to the surface. So it's just very smooth and you don't see the grains of the wood necessarily. You just see the smooth waxy surface. Um, uh, that is what the uh, artist will paint on, okay? Now with oil paint, um, artists began in the early 1400s, even earlier actually, with mixing uh, oil. So you can have different kinds of oils. Uh, plant oils tend to be better than animal oils because if you use oil from uh, uh, animal, um, then it tends to decay and change color. Whereas if you use oil from plants, uh, in this case, uh, typically uh, linseed oil, um, but we know lots of plant oils, right? Um, sunflower, uh, sometimes, uh, so it's a variety of different oils that you can find. Um, vegetable oils basically is what we use for cooking. Um, and so um, you can use, as you know, like olive oil has a thickness to it and also can have color. It can be kind of a greenish tone to 
do it. So all different oils have different properties, but um, Jan van Eyck tended to settle on using uh, linseed oil because that give, gave the highest degree of stability in terms of the color. So you don't, you know, if you mix it with oil, you don't know what color it might uh, turn out to be or how long the color will last. Will it darken over time? Will it fade over time? And so making new color recipes, when you're adding a new ingredient, all your recipes are going to shift. Um, and so Jan van Eyck, the reason why he's so famous is because he came up with some of the earliest uh, new color recipes that were very stable colors, uh, as you see here, because red was one of the ones that could fade very easily, but he's got a very stable red here, um, as you can see, very beautiful color. Now, um, oil paint dries more slowly and you can layer it. That's an important aspect of that. You can layer it. So these artists would use very, very tiny brushes. Again, look at this gold. You can actually see the brushes. You can see the hairs of the brush that he's using. Just put a little dab of that gold paint on there so some of it, it, so it doesn't have a uniformity to it, but it just looks like it kind of shimmers a bit. So these artists were trying to get this very shimmery quality, this both reflective and refractive property from oil paint. And since oil is thick, it has a higher it, uh, refractive uh, property to it because the particles, whatever it is, lapis particles, powders, sit in that oil at different depths. Okay, so, um, so it's much more kind of luminous basically is what it is, the color. So that's what he was trying to achieve. And if you look at the pearls here, um, they look like the pearls have been stitched onto this fabric and sewn along the bottom with tiny little threads. There's other stones and gems on here as well, but the pearls look like they're standing away from this fabric. Okay, he achieves that by going in, making the circles for every pearl, okay, um, and then using light dark contrast to give it a sense of three dimensionality. And at the very end, after that dries, that second layer, he will come in with a little dot of that bright white, and each one gets a little dot, so it looks like that's the point that is the closest to the viewer. Okay, so with oil paint, you can get a higher ability of um, shading and shadowing, more nuanced, more subtle shading and shadowing. Um, you can get depth of color more because you can actually layer the color. So, um, so you can also get, excuse me, so you can also get um, more uh, or richer colors, like newer colors, like this blue here you can see um, is a deeper kind of lapis. So you can you can do more color mixtures because the color dries more slowly. Um, and so you can layer the colors more and get uh, different shades, all right? Um, and so look at this um, crown. You can see the front and back of it, and it has rubies. It has all different gems in it. It's very, very incredible uh, colors that you can achieve. So um, the level of realism is, is, is quite incredible. But let me go back to this image, because look at um, John the Baptist here. He wears green, which is not a color that he normally wears. So, But this is a new color that Jan van Eyck was experimenting with. He was trying to get kind of an emerald green, like bird feathers, quetzal feathers, um, which, uh, which were actually increasingly known at this time period, colors and materials from other parts of the world. Um, this, is, this is a little, this is before Cortez and so forth, but, but still you get some of that um, uh, exchange through trade routes. And so uh, the green then is like an emerald green, but it's his new color. It's a new color recipe he came up with. And so people looking at this painting, um, part of the, the appeal of this painting for me is like this incredible technical ability, but that technical ability translated into uh, like a sense of being believable to the religious viewer of the Renaissance. Um, so they would have looked at this painting, it would have been an icon, it would have been a didactic work, but more importantly, they would have been in awe of this painting in that, that sense of the awesomeness of it translated into their religious sort of sentiment. So people would have looked at that green and they would have really never seen this color of green before. It, it, it looks like the grass, but it's slightly different. Um, uh, it, the colors that they that they began to see were so new um, that it was just really an incredible experience to go into a church 
um, and to see these paintings. Um, and I think they would have been swept away by them, maybe even more so than us, because today we see all colors in this palette, you know, our palette, which is the, um, the grouping of colors that you use for a painting, the palette now can be, you know, ever expansive because we have synthetic colors and everything now. But back then, when an artist introduced new colors, it was a, a it was a marvelous thing. Um, and so that sense of marvel, that sense of that, that this was all inspiring, that people didn't understand how these new colors came to be, um, gave these paintings uh, this importance within the church. Okay, and that's something um, that you can achieve with uh, oil paint, I think, this higher degree of realism. So you think a work that is more realistic, you know, um, obviously religious beliefs often have this high level of abstraction to them, which is why in the Middle Ages, uh, most religious works were, were abstract because they were kind of moving away. They didn't want to reference the, the physical world necessarily in their spiritual beliefs. Um, but in the Renaissance, they do. Um, and it's an interesting way, this heightened form of realism, uh, it's an interesting way of kind of directing people's religious beliefs uh, to where they are grounded on the earthly realm and then inspiring them to look above that, to look higher up as you do uh, in this painting as well, okay? Um, and so in the article, you'll read more about the cloth of honor in that incredible detail. Um, but I think this oil paint is, is, is something that was uh, uh, pivotal in um, the uh, discussion of the, the religious context of works at this time period, okay? Here, this is just a, uh, another image because it was hard to see the, um, the lamb here, but the lamb has golden rays of light coming up from his head, so he's divine. And then if you look up above, um, this is the, the rays of light coming down. It's like it's coming down from the sun, but it's actually the heavenly realm. So golden light then symbolizes the divine presence. So when you walk into a church um, and the light pours in through stained glass windows in these Gothic churches, they, they come in through these stained glass windows and, and just the color kind of dances across the floor. It's so beautiful. Um, and that is suggestive of the divine light. So when you get reflective and refractive sort of coloring and you get the shimmering, shiny colors, it's like it's imbued with divinity. Okay, so, um, and then you've got on top of that, these golden rays of light coming in, covering over this this, this world that looks very like, a, you know, the earthly realm. There's a path that goes back behind the lamb. You can see, you can walk back to this town in the distance. Um, and then he uses color shifts going more toward blue tones to give the appearance of uh, depth, okay? That's called atmospheric perspective when you shift your color tones um, so that it looks like things are further off in the distance um, based on kind of reflections from the sky and so forth. So it's a kind of a trick of the eye because we know mountains in the background are not blue, but it's how we see it. It's an optical uh, kind of a paradox. Um, but it's one that when you get a broader palette, uh, you can achieve with to greater degrees of realism. And then look at the trees. I mean, you can see individual tree trunks, branches, and so forth. The level detail is incredible. These are paintings that, you know, if you grow up in Ghent, you would go back and see this painting over and over and over again. This is not like a one-time go to the museum and look at a painting, but you would grow up with this painting, hearing sermons, going back to visit throughout the year, um, except when the panels are closed uh, during liturgical holidays and then open to reveal the inside miraculously. Um, and then, you know, you would spend a lot of time with these paintings. So that level of detail, I think, helps uh, uh, with that. You see this beautiful red brocade covering the altar that the lamb stands upon, okay? And these angels are kind of swinging the incense and so forth. So you see this uh, high level of detail even in the angelic figures. Okay. Um, 
So uh, that's all I want to show you for the Ghent altar piece, but just uh, one final work. This is not a religious work. Um, this is a marriage portrait um, from 1434 by Jan van Eyck, but he takes a lot of those ideas from his religious works into works that are secular. And in fact, even though this is in a bedroom, uh, marriage is one of the sacraments and you can see light coming in the background behind the young married couple. They're called the Arnolfini. So this is called the Arnolfini wedding portrait, but that light coming in the background, you don't have the golden rays coming in, but still that light has that same symbolic value. And look at the incredible way that Jan van Eyck is able to modulate that light coming in behind Giovanni Arnolfini. Look also at the fur. Um, he's wearing real fur. Um, and uh, you can see, if you've seen real fur, real fur is not as popular anymore now, but people used to wear it all the time, big fur coats and everything. And if you look at real fur, um, it sometimes has a purple quality to it when it reflects. And so Jan van Eyck has sort of captured that quality of the fur that the man is wearing. And there's that green, okay? This is his characteristic green. And in fact, this young woman, um, Giovanna is her name, uh, she probably, her wedding dress probably didn't even look like this. It wouldn't have been green, um, but that, but Jan van Eyck is sort of putting his color stamp on her almost. Um, and then the dog, the dog has this incredible, the dog is actually the same color as the man's fur coat and the same color as the floor, which is a humble wood floor, but through the different kind of brush strokes, uh, Jan van Eyck is showing us that he can, even though he's invented all of these new sort of incredible rich and bright colors, he can also just use browns, the same palette on the floor as the dog, but they look completely different because different movement of the brush. Okay. Um, and so if you're doing dog hair, your every strand of your brush is going to be like a strand of the dog fur, right? So you would need tons of different brushes. And um, actually Leonardo da Vinci uh, had brushes that were just one strand of horse hair because he said, when you're doing uh, horse hair, you just need a horse hair to paint that horse hair with. Um, and so with oil paint, then you have this, uh, this, um, really kind of dramatic expansion of, of brushes, types of brushes and the way that brushes were used too. So, uh, so again, a shift in your technique and in the materials you're using um, can really highlight uh, the kind of features that you're trying to achieve. And at this time period in the 1400s uh, in Europe, uh, these paintings, even if it's a secular one like this one, you say it's secular if it's not religious, um, secular and sacred work, Works, but secular works often will carry in that, that level of importance, that honor uh, um, as well in a serious image like this, which uh, is perhaps their, their wedding portrait, okay? Um, here's the level of detail in the background as well, which gives us the signature of Jan van Eyck, very rare, um, but many people think this is perhaps a signature as a notary at the wedding, as a kind of a document, that this might be a document prior to their wedding on, a, on the day when they get like engaged and the dowry is established. Um, it's called ring day. So this could actually be ring day. And we see the young couple from the backs in that mirror. Look at that mirror. It is a distorted mirror because it is convex, okay? So Jan van Eyck is really wanting us to see his technique with the curvature of that window, the figures from the back and two other figures in the front. Many people think one's the artist, so there'd be two witnesses, another family member, perhaps the father, okay? Um, and here's the dog. You can see here the same colors used in the floor as the dog. The dog probably is the belonging to the um, woman. The dog faces the woman and it's Fido, right? He, he um, references fidelity. Okay. Um, so that is all for my slides. Um, but it's mainly the Ghent altarpiece that I want you to look at carefully. Um, and when you read the article, you'll read more about the beautiful fabrics and clothing. And as you do that, you can look online and find tons more details of this painting, um, because I think it's really with the details that uh, we have this incredible uh, uh, kind of um, 
kind of reaction to these paintings. Um, and in this case, this reaction you get from seeing this magnificent painting is to be channeled uh, into your religious beliefs, both through, you know, um, uh, kind of elevating your belief system through enlightenment. Uh, so they're either icons or just through educating you about the different stories, Adam and Eve, who these characters are uh, within the Catholic Church. Okay. Um, so that is all I have for you all. Uh, so um, hope you enjoyed this lecture and make sure to read that article. And if any of you have any questions, um, you can of course ask uh, um, uh, Dr. Duncan O'Neill, or you can, if you have any questions about uh, my area of research, or if you want to take a class with me, you can always email me too. It's, um, I'm Allison Palmer, so it's a palmer at um, so enjoy the rest of the semester and maybe I'll see you all soon.